Coming up on Tech Thing, need a new TV? Good ones are getting so cheap. Camera sensors are really freaking cool. Let's talk Amazon Echo Multiroom Audio. And hey, have you backed up your precious data yet? We got more hurricanes and wildfires tearing things up. Let's talk about it all on Tech Thing. Thanks to our patrons, patreon.com slash tech thing. Shannon and I get to make the show for you each and every week. Be a part of the crew at patreon.com slash tech thing. I'm Shannon Morris. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Not this week. <laughs> I'm just I'm done. funning with you. <laughs> We're out, people. We have a lot happening this episode, so I'm super excited to talk about cameras. You have all of the cameras right I, now. I have way too many cameras. One of these cameras is not like the other, but we'll talk about that in a second. A <laughs> couple of random thoughts to start the show. Is it me or is $1,000, <clears> excuse me, $960 for a phone just too damn much money? I may have spent that much on a Google Pixel XL because I upgraded to the biggest memory that you could get at 128 gigabytes. Early reviews of the Galaxy Note 8 all seem to pretty much be, it's awesome, it's better than the last Note, plus no fire. But <laughs> damn, how much? That is a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. $960. Well, I guess it's like $930, $960. Um, and then uh, if you take a look uh, at the, the iPhone rumors, yeah, that's rumored to be like $1,000. $1,000. Yeah, that's what it's rumored at. We don't know for sure if it's going to be that much. $2,000? I'm going to say $3,500. <laughs> for a phone. For the one terabyte version. <laughs> I'm kidding. I feel like that's going way farther than inflation. <laughs> all I know is, I, I just, all I can think of is that there are so many amazing mid-priced phones right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and the camera in my wife's iPhone SE is freaking amazing, although I need to have my reading glasses on to actually read the screen. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 yeah, it's <laughs> a lot of money. So what else did you find out this week? Important safety tip. Okay. Okay. You can blow through 18 gigabytes of data on your mobile service really fast if your online backup is rolling and you forget to turn the hotspot feature off on your phone. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. Yep. That happened to you, didn't it? Well, there's, the AT&T gives you one warning at 75% of your data consumed for the month. Okay. I hit that approximately <laughs> 24 hours into the month. Oh, no. Yeah, it's like... Gosh, it's the first day? Well, yeah. Well, it's also interesting wow. is, is, is I, I bounced a tweet off of Sasha Sagan over PC Mac, phenomenal phone reviewer, uh, knows everything. He's amazing. Um, and a nice human being, too. I was like, it seems like AT&T and Verizon don't want large data customers or people that consume a lot mm -hmm. of data and they don't and part of the reason you know that is if you are on a current AT&T plan you can no longer buy extra gigabytes oh. so if I go through my 25 gigabytes for the month I will be throttled to 128 kilobits per second oh no yeah oh that's terrible and you know you could also talk about like well my service promises me unlimited data take a close look now mm -hmm. I, admittedly like blowing through 18 gigabytes because I'm an idiot is one thing, but I've had months where like when we were traveling at CES and I did do remote podcasts, oh, yeah. and we're transferring yep. a bunch of data, I've gone through 20 gigabytes of data in a month. Easily, yeah. But most of the unlimited services basically say they they either will throttle you to a certain point or they have the option of throttling you yeah. to a certain point. Always curious to hear back what you guys are running into in the real world out there if you get throttled back to 128K or if you just get to keep zipping through the data without a care. <laughs> I get to zip through the data, but I'm charged an extra $10 every time I use up another gig. So it comes with one gig with the plan on uh, Google Fi, but right. after that you pay 10 bucks every time. Or you accrue it depending on how many gigs or partial gigs that you use. I just, I, I have a feeling I'm going to end up with T-Mobile on my Android phone so I have Ooh. data for the rest of the month and maybe I'll get the rest of my phones on T-Mobile. Take yeah. that, AT&T. Take might, that. Might be a good idea. <laughs> month to month, baby. <laughs> oh my goodness. We are having a mini Mobile World Congress here in San Francisco next week. What? I'm excited. I'm going to be in Disneyland. You should be excited <laughs> for completely different reasons. Hey, if I am here, I will definitely check it out because I've never gotten to go to a Mobile World Congress before. Because they're normally in Barcelona, which yes. is fabulous, but so, incredibly expensive to travel to. That would be awesome, but uh, yeah, definitely Disney landing. I'm excited about that. I will never go to Disneyland again unless my children beg me. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> I had an experience. Um, we won't talk about that. <laughs> Something that is not so exciting, another hurricane is stomping northward mm. out of the Caribbean. Uh, I imagine most folks aren't even close to getting back into their homes in Houston. Um, but yes, there is another major dangerous hurricane uh, 
in, uh, well, basically heading towards Florida, as yeah. you can tell. It is called Irma. It is a Category 5 hurricane. And if as you are, of day of recording. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Uh, and, and if you are not a weather nerd, uh, a Category 5 hurricane basically says the winds are going to be hitting 157 miles per hour Whoa. or higher. That's really scary. It is really scary. So having family that lives on a little skinny island that mm -hmm. basically floods if too many people flush their toilet at the same time <laughs> during the Super Bowl, um, I will say hurricanes have a funny habit like, okay, this Irma may wander up the, directly down the middle of the Florida mm -hmm. Panhandle uh, and then right on its tail is Tropical Storm Jose, which is apparently getting ready to get to, into full-on hurricane status because yeah. this season is going to be one of those seasons. It might veer off, it might lose momentum, mm -hmm. it might downgrade, it might hit a whole bunch of cold water and everything might go kind of like chill, but it might not. So seriously, take a moment, look around you right now, and imagine that you've got, say, 12 hours to leave. Or if you're in a shelter in place kind of disaster locale, like here in the Bay Area, funny thing I've ever yeah. heard, somebody's like, well, you know, we're going to our parents' house up in the Sierra when the earthquake happens. And I just laughed, and the guy's like, what's so funny? I'm like. July 4th, it's six hours to drive seven miles to get to the Carquinez Bridge. And you're gonna get, after the major earthquake, the one that made the bridge yeah. collapse and crush a bunch of people, yep. oh, and the highways crush a bunch of people, you're gonna drive to your parents' place in the Sierra? Right. This is why I'm learning how to sail. <laughs> Sailing? <laughs> so I could just get around the bridge. <laughs> I, we actually, it was one of the things I was, I was waiting to save up enough money and then I, I no longer work in San Francisco, but I was like, I need to buy a kayak, the, one of the Oreo yes. kayaks that folds up yes, so I can exactly. get back to Alameda. You never know what's going to happen and we have bridges surrounding yeah. us, so we need to have a way out. This is why I have a backpack at home, a backpack in my car, and I'm learning how to sail. I'm a little weird. You're <laughs> not weird. Zombie apocalypse is a thing, okay? <laughs> well, the thing my parents taught me is if a hurricane is coming towards you, yeah. you get off the island before the hurricane gets close. Because by the time you know sense. the hurricane's going to hit the island, you're not going to be able to get off. Yeah. Um, yeah. In any case, do you have what you need to get through 72 hours or a week mm -hmm. or three weeks? Take a moment to think about that. Have you done your offside backups yet? Yes. Make no. sure you have those offside backups. Just make sure you don't accidentally do them over your phone because <laughs> yeah. you forgot to turn the hotspot feature off. Have you actually started them? Can you pull the hard drive out of your desktop if you have no other option? Mm -hmm. Get a pel Pelican case. A Pelican case is a really good option. Yeah. Otter boxes are really awesome. I've tested those. They actually work work really good. Or a gallon Ziploc bag. I mean, heck, if you don't have anything else in your house, a Ziploc bag will technically work as well. I've been, I've taken phones in a Ziploc bag and shoved them underwater for several oh, minutes yeah. at a pop. So, you know, if you're desperate, <laughs> use what you got. It'll work. <laughs> yeah, seriously. If the waters are rising or a forest fire is closing in on your neighborhood or you come back from your job in the city and a tornado wiped out your entire city block or your entire country block or just your house. I've seen that. Like, well, Bob's mm. house is gone. That's a scary thing no. when you're in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yeah. Uh, are you going to say, damn it, you really should have scanned those photos of the kids? which are now spread all over the Oklahoma Panhandle, or if you live near my folks, the Jersey Shore, the Atlantic Ocean, Little Lake Harbor. I mean, literally, in the case of some folks I know, their memories went flooding off into the bay. Yeah. Um, wedding photos of my parents, gone. They didn't wash away, but they were destroyed because nobody ever expected the water to get that high. Yeah. So, I don't mean to sound harsh, but if Irma marches up or lightning strikes or some dumbass teenager throws firecrackers uh, during fires, did you hear about this? <laughs> no. Yeah, the Columbia River Gorge is on I fire. I believe it, though. Yeah. That's how it started? Mm -hmm. that, wow. that is That is the current, the teens in question are wow. working with the police, but that is apparently is what started the fire. Throwing firecrackers, <sighs> it's a thing. I actually, I really hope the-, the Oh, that the, beer pub has my name on it after work today. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for the teenager, but seriously, it's fire season. Don't throw exploding things into the dry tinder-like Western United States. Yeah, you know, in any case, you know, if 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 disaster is marching your way, you're going to wish you left early rather than late. And part mm -hmm. of doing that is to be prepared ahead of time. Yes. Speaking of which, I had to push out the Mesh Network review till next week uh, because a bit of hardware uh, choked on its own packets and died. Not no. its fault. It happens. <laughs> It happens. So if you got some Wi-Fi slash mess slash networking questions, fire them out to ask a tech thing com or tweet at Patrick Norton. After Shannon talked briefly about shutter speeds, ISO and aperture on tech thing, this was all related to eclipse photography, <laughs> Manuel emailed, good introduction into the world of photography. You should also have talked about sensor sizes, smartphones, APS-C, full frame, medium format, which is very important for picture quality. It makes a lot of difference when talking about lenses with different focal lengths.
Manuel. Yes, he is totally right. So sensor sizes play a very important role in photography, and I didn't include that when I was previously chatting about the exposure triangle, because it was the exposure triangle. Right. And sensor sizes aren't a part of that triangle <laughs> uh, of manual settings, and you can use them in most higher price cameras. So I really wanted to talk about sensor sizes right. as well, because Manuel's totally right. It is very, very important. So to give you a physical idea of these different sensor sizes, I brought all my different cameras out. It's show and tell day. Yay. Yay! So first off, I have my Pixel XL, which has a 1 over 2.3 inch CMOS sensor. That's about 1 half inch CMOS sensor. It's 12 megapixels. Mm -hmm. The GoPro Hero 4 Sil Silver has a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor as well. This is very standard for most action cams of mm -hmm. this generation. I can't quote you on the newer generations of action cams because I don't have one, so I haven't looked it up. But this one is also 12 megapixels. Then we have the Sony Cybershot DSC RX100. This has a one inch sensor and it's an Exmor CMOS sensor as well, but it's 20 megapixels. Moving up from this, we get the first one that can change out the lens. So I can take this lens off and put something else on it. It's the Sony A6000. This has an APS-C mirrorless sensor, and that's a heck of a lot bigger than those little CMOS sensors. Mm -hmm. And this one is uh, about 24 megapixels in size whenever you take photos. And lastly, we have my baby. This is my true, my pride and joy. I'm not allowed to touch this He's one. not allowed to touch it, it's true. <laughs> it's my Sony a7R II. It has a full frame 35 millimeter sensor, which stands out at 42 megapixels. So it's huge, it means you can blow up like gigantic photos. Oh my goodness. Oh yes. So there are also other ones in between and I actually found this awesome graph online because I know that some of those titles are a little bit confusing, but this basically shows you all the different sizes and physically what those sensors look like from a small little smartphone all the way up to a medium format and like my Sony a7R II, that full frame camera. So this will give you a nice comparison. You'll notice that as the sensor size goes up, so do the megapixels for most of the, most right. of the time. Now if I do take one of these lenses off, you can also see the sensor inside of it, and I'll show you an example on this one since it's rather large. I gotta be very careful with it, but the sensor. Can I touch that? No, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> the sensor is inside of there. You can kind of see it when I glint it against the sun. Keep that protected. It is the brain of your camera if it gets or at scratched. Least the eyes. If it gets scratched, if you have to replace it, it's expensive to replace, and you don't want that thing to get dust on it or anything like that. So I generally just keep a lens on it or I keep it covered if I wanna take the lens off. Now I realize that the naming conventions are kind of old. As <laughs> I know Patrick was a little weirded out by the smaller oh, ones like, on yeah, here. Yeah, I, like, I was like, is that one one over three? Is that one? One over it's three like point two inch. It's, a third it's of an weird, inch. yeah. Yeah, so, I've never seen that before. So instead of looking at those, cause they don't make a lot of sense if you're not a right. photographer, Look at the millimeter sizes right underneath it, and I'll make that a little bit bigger. So you can see the smallest ones are 4.54 by 3.42 millimeters, and then you go up in size all the way to mine, which is 36 millimeters in size. So sensor sizes affect how heavy a camera might be. They affect how much light is brought into a camera for low light photography. They affect how well a photo will look if you print it out and you want to blow it up. Mm -hmm. I have a canvas printing of this awesome Tori gate from Japan that I printed out with this camera right. that's like this large. It's huge. I could not do that with my smartphone because the sensor won't allow me to get a nice blown up picture like that. It'll be well, pixelated. Yeah, it'll be blown up, but it'll be like it'll be big, real, giant it'll pixels. Look, it'll look bad. <laughs> One of the things you run into in between generations of the little tiny sensors that are in here mm -hmm. is a lot of times, if it goes from like 12 to 15 megapixels, a yeah. lot of times you'll hear reviews that are like, low light performance, was well it sucked yeah and what happens is a lot of times if you have the same sensor size and increase the pixels the pixels are smaller they can gather less light and mm -hmm. it makes it less uh, sensitive in yeah. low light conditions. That's why I've never been particularly obsessed about megapixels on cell phones. Exactly, yeah, and that's very, very important to point out. Now, middle price cameras, those do really well. They mm -hmm. are very travel friendly because they do have those one inch or larger sensors, but they are still small and compact, so you can fit in, in a purse, in a backpack, or whatever you want, or in your back pocket, really. Uh, lower ones, like the smartphone cameras, those don't play so well in those lower light settings. They don't do as well because they can't physically draw in as much light to the sensor because it's physically small. It's, it's teeny tiny. <laughs> now, 
before the well actually is coming, because I know there will be some, sometimes a manufacturer can add in software or additional technology to make up for sensor sizes. So for example, there's this thing called back illuminated sensors. Those can improve low light photography even in those smaller sensor sizes. Sony, for example, does this with some of their cameras, and I'll put a link in the show notes to a Wikipedia thing all about back illuminated sensors. It's actually really fascinating. Very technical. I'm not going to memorize it. It's so nerdly so quickly. <laughs> it's so nerdly. <laughs> Actual outcomes of your photography may also vary if you're using that exposure triangle and stuff like that, depending on the triangle of settings, what kind of lens you're using. If you use a cheap lens on your nice sensor, you're not going to get as good of a picture, for example. Right. It really depends on what kind of output you are looking for as well. Uh, and, and two, how much are you willing to carry? So I'm not going to tell you, like, you have to get a full frame sensor because you might not. You, well, it I mean, that really depends on what you want to get out of your photography. You literally almost as paid as much for that camera as my paid for a 7,000 pound diesel truck that will last me another 10 years. Yeah, but I also use it for a lot of professional work, too. Yes. Like I take it to CES and I get B-roll and I do all sorts of stuff like that. And in, it is the best camera I have ever seen in low light. I know Sorry. guys that have been using Nikon and <laughs> Canon cameras for like a decade and they <laughs> sold their glass and they all went with the new Sony's about I a generation ago. I love it so ago. much. They I are really amazing. Do. It's technolast right there. So yeah. another thing to consider with sensor sizes is cropping. Now if you stick a full frame, say like a 55 millimeter prime lens, which is like I have right here, on your APS-C sensor camera, like this one, mm -hmm. you will notice that the scene you are shooting ends up being cropped a little bit. Now, most of the time, the lens size needs to be sufficient enough to cover the dimensions of the sensor. So first off, so I could not use a little mini lens on a larger full frame camera, obviously, because it ain't gonna fit. The 55 <laughs> millimeter lens on my a7R II is marked with its actual focal length, mm -hmm. length if I use it on my full frame camera. If I stick the same lens on my APS-C camera, the same photo from the same place, and I'm standing at the exact same spot, and I don't zoom in or anything because you can't with a prime lens, uh, it will appear pro cropped because the smaller sensor won't be able to take advantage of the wider size of the lens. I mean, think of the lens of the camera as being a projector, right? Yeah. And then somebody walks up with a smaller screen. Yeah. Which is, I mean, literally, <laughs> This is a smaller screen yeah. than the camera I'm not allowed to touch there over you there. Go. Yeah, so that's literally a good way of Picturing you, it. you get to see this much of the screen and the rest of it just disappears. <laughs> I found this excellent photo. It's over at newatlas.com and this shows an example of what happens. So first off, you have your full frame, which is the big one. APS-C is just a little bit smaller. It's that middle orange uh, square. And then as you go down in size, like one inch, like my Sony Cybershot, is this smaller green square. And then uh, smartphone cameras, which are the middle one. That's how cropped your image will look if you're standing in the same place and you're using the same kind of lens with each of those different sizes of sensors. What a lovely shot of the inner earlobe. I know, it's, it's so, so stunning. <laughs> Now there are a lot of other factors to consider whenever you are buying a camera too, along with cost and low light usage and weight and what lens are you gonna buy. Some brands are not compatible with other brands, even if they're the same sensor right. size. Like uh, I don't think my Sony lenses are compatible with Canon unless I get an adapter for them. Don't quote me on that. But um, <laughs> yeah, this, you need an adapter to make some of them work together. Right. Some full frame lenses will, will look worse than a nice APS-C lens on an APS-C camera even if the full frame lens has a better aperture, which is super weird to think about, but these things happen. This is a rabbit hole. It really, really is. But if you want to learn, learn about sensor sizes, this should get you started. I'm going to go ahead and end it here, but if you do want to have more segments about like choosing mm -hmm. photography equipment, choosing cameras, camera technology, let Technique. me know. I love talking about mm -hmm. photography. It's something that I got into back in 2014 when I went on my honeymoon, and I haven't stopped, and I, I've just been obsessed with it ever since then. So I'm learning a ton as I go as well. So of course, if you have any questions, send them, send them over to me. I think that the more segments we do like this, the better our husbands will be at taking photos for our Instagram accounts. So we can't go wrong. We really can't, ladies. All five of you out there. Email askatechthing.com with any questions, or you can tweet me at snubs, and you can tweet at techthing as well. Can I hold the... Record? Nope. We've said it before, we love your questions, ask at techthing.com. And if you hate email, tweet at techthing at snubs or at Patrick Norton or go to, well, facebook.com slash techthing. There are so many ways to reach us. And hey, if you could spare a moment or two to give our video the thumbs up on YouTube, like our Facebook page, or tell a friend about the show, we'd be grateful. 
And as always, patreon.com slash tech thing is your way to help keep the show ad free and get your eyes and ears on special content that only goes out to our patrons, patreon.com slash tech thing. Thank you so much for supporting the show, no matter how you do it. We got an email from Richard who writes, need a 40 inch television for main viewing source. Darn, we thought that built in for the old 35 inch was a great ideal. Please recommend best choice under 2K and what you would buy with your monies. Thanks for the advice. Love the podcast. Keep up the good work from Richard. Thank you, Richard. Yes, thank you. I have excellent news. 2000 is way too much money to spend on a 40 inch television these yes. days. Save that money. Mm hmm. Bad Put it news. Towards use. I really, really want you to get a bigger TV. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> what, 40 inch isn't good enough? There's nothing wrong with a 40 inch television. But the exp I mean, here's the thing, right? I, I get it. You've got a built in furniture, it's locking you into that 40 inch size. Mm -hmm. But maybe you could blow out that built in and fit in a fantastic. 55 inch TCL 55P607 in there. Ooh. This is, if you're not gonna spend all the money for a high end TV, uh, i.e. an OLED, this is an amazing television for the money. Um, cool. Seriously, you will spend a lot more money uh, before you get serious improvements in color or brightness. Uh, it runs on the Roku operating system, which means it'll still be supported I in a couple Roku. years. It is $750, it is 4K, it is UHD, it is HDR. 750 it looks like it's 650 well you know it, i looked Ooh. at the last price on uh, amazon maybe so it went down in price maybe it did it's on a sale price get it now actually you know what maybe i just read the wrong price because i'm foolish <laughs> in any case uh, okay 650 bucks on amazon.com because apparently i can't read and fyi uh, tcl it was originally supposed to do a 50 and a 60 inch version but they have killed those off the 55 inches so popular mm. or more likely they just simply can't get the glass for the 50 and 60 inch versions i have a really cheap 55 inch at home and it pretty much does the job and it's amazing and it's so pretty and i bought it back in 2010 so mm -hmm. it has no smarts whatsoever That's which i kind of like <laughs> i kind of like that yeah privacy yay but uh, yeah, 55 well, inches. Well, it may totally still be good. tracking what you do. Just well, no, actually, if there's no internet, there's no internet, then it's not tracking. It is you. no IoT whatsoever. If it is, it's keeping it to itself, which is the same <laughs> thing, pretty much. Um, <laughs> by the way, if you're trying to find a television that doesn't have any smart features built in, give up. They basically don't exist. They're called computer <laughs> monitors. Um, by the way, if getting rid of the built-in cabinet is not an option. Um, get a 40 inch TCL, uh, they have a 1080p version also powered by Roku, it is $250 and I'll pull it up on Amazon.com just so I get it straight. Ooh. Yeah, it's a nice television for the money. Um, or, since you have that $2,000 budget, you could buy a 1080p projector and a motorized screen and upgrade your lifestyle to a 100 or 110 inch screen and when you basically hit your Logitech Harmony remote, the projector will light up, the screen will come down, your favorite box of choice will fire up, and you will have all of the awesome in a cinematic environment. This guy. He's been trying to get everybody to buy a projector for as long as I can remember. Projectors are awesome. I like TVs. Nothing wrong with a TV, but a projector is better. I figured out where I got $750 from. Where'd you find it? Well, I so that the television, right, the $650 television, yeah. is actually selling for $735 now on Amazon.com. Oh. And what's really odd is if you look at that model um, on Camel, oh. Camel, Camel, look, Amazon price is $650. Huh? Except it's 700 something today. Weird. Yeah. Mm, but this okay. is only up to like September 3rd or 4th. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It, it's usually like a day behind, isn't it? And it did, yeah, well, it did mm. hit $799 on June 19th, 2017. So Weird. maybe that's when they released it. Hmm. Interesting. I remain fascinated. Interesting. Got an email from Don who sent us a link to The Verge's article on Amazon Echo Multi Room Music Playback How to Set It Up. Yay! Oh my goodness. I am so excited about this. So, Amazon just added multi room audio to their Amazon Echo devices. Woohoo! This is something I have been waiting for for quite a long time, <laughs> ever since I bought that original generation of the Amazon Echo. So this lets you stream audio to multiple Amazon Echo devices at once, including Amazon Music, uh, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and then also Pandora with Spotify and Sirius XM, which are going to be coming soon, not currently available at time of recording. Call me when Spotify is here. <laughs> <laughs> This is great for me. I use Pandora and Amazon Music, so I'm good. So to set it up, you go into the Alexa app, you choose settings, you scroll down in your menu to audio
audio groups, and then you choose multi-room music. Enable a new group, call it whatever you want, and then you save it. So you can have multiple audio room groupings if you want, if you just want the bedrooms in your household to play certain music mm -hmm. while the living room plays something else. Uh, you could do that if you wanted to. I just have it set to everywhere, so I would say uh, Echo, play music everywhere, where everywhere is whatever your group name is, <laughs> and then it'll play whatever you want it to, Pandora, App, uh, Amazon Music or whatever it might be. So another thing that they did is they also recently opened up their API to third-party services. So another perk I have been waiting for is, with bated breath still <laughs> is Sonos to pair with the Echo without a hack. Yes, I am aware that hacks are available, but I want it to just work. So I am still waiting. It's been over a year since they started teasing it. So any day now, any day, it would be great. But I did ask them if their current line works with it. They linked me over to their page. And they also say, we haven't shared all the details, but you will be able to control all updated Sonos units with Alexa devices. And then they linked over to uh, this, where you can read through the steps to do that with your Connect Amp or your Connect or your Play 5. And you can also sign up That's to find out when it gets fully integrated with Sonos. And that is the thing I'm waiting for, is to have it fully integrated. The customer help Sonos web pages are, are long and involve lots of letters. So we will put a link to that in the show notes. So true. So true. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Meanwhile, PacNW fan emails, so are you going to choose Sonos or your privacy? <sighs> you will only be able to have one. So if you don't care about the privacy, good chance you can pick up a Sonos speaker on the cheap soon from PacNW fan. And it's funny he said that because I Pack got Northwest. a... 15% off coupon for Sonos this morning from Sonos.com. How exciting. Hmm. I guess they are getting on the cheap, aren't they? Well, uh, yeah. But Relatively so. He's talking about a mass exodus based on everyone being angry and fighting against the man, or in this case, the Sonos, for trying to snorkel your information. <laughs> he says while staring at his Google Mail and his Google Calendar on his iPhone and his internet connection, which are tracked by everyone everywhere. There you time. go. <laughs> so, okay, so a uh, Pack Northwest fan uh, uh, sent a link to a ZDNet article titled, Sonos says users must accept new privacy policy <sighs> or devices may cease to function. Oh, no. The sound system maker will not allow existing customers to opt out of the new privacy policy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Zach Whitaker for zero day. It's getting a little... Hacks so are sounds a little scary panicky. there. So, okay, so the new privacy policy hasn't gone into effect yet. And this is, I may sound dismissive, right? But let me be clear. Privacy or the lack thereof with your devices is an issue. Vizio got nailed to the floor for mm -hmm. it because they opted you in automatically to have mm -hmm. your television track your information and, and, and basically made it you know, effectively impossible to opt out because you wouldn't even know to look for it. Um, there are lots of devices. There are lots of applications. There's lots of stuff which makes its money by just taking a look at what you do, mm -hmm. selling the information to third parties. Um, you know, the, the, their Plex had a big foo -rah where they basically said, we're going to start doing this stuff, and their user base went, no, and Plex went, we're not going to do this stuff, and it was all related to privacy. Google recently got in trouble for reading your mail, and uh, <sighs> I think they, they just decided to give some kind of fine to uh, the, the court system, but uh, often apparently they're not going to read your mail for advertising for a while. <laughs> okay. It's not permanent. Thanks, Google. Yeah, thanks, it's Google. It's a thing. They, they know everything. Yeah, they should do. Should they choose to look at it. In any case, my point is, um, so Sonos is, uh, so Sonos has a whole page, you know, what you should know about a new privacy statement. I started digging through it because I got like five Sonos devices in my house. So this is kind of a big deal to me. Um, and I, I realized I'm not nearly as upset as I probably would be because pretty much the data they're passing through, uh, what Sonos hears, records, and keeps. Um, is, you know what, they're passing data through to the voice assistant service you use, like Amazon or Google Home or whatever future ones they might include. <clears throat> um, and they say that they won't keep any recordings of your voice data, which mm -hmm. you got to take the promises at face value. Much like when we talk about a VPN. Do you mm -hmm. trust the VPN? If you don't trust the VPN, don't use the VPN. How do you know to trust right. the VPN? Well, that's a trust thing. Um, I don't have any spying, you know, the, yeah, they are, they are talking about sharing data with their partners, for example, to do Spotify, they have to give information to Spotify for the service to work, yeah. or else Spotify can't be like, here's that song you wanted to hear. Um, since I don't have any spying devices in my house like Shannon does, I'm not particularly worried <laughs> about being listened to. I have an Amazon Echo. 
Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm joking, right? Yeah. But it's like. But it's kind of true. Yeah, I mean, it's sitting there <laughs> waiting for the word. And when it hears the word, it does what you command. Or does it? Does it secretly listen 24 7? Probably not, because I think even the court system <laughs> in the United States would punish a company that did that. But oh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing, though. As near as I can tell, all of the information in here, okay, so they're collecting some information about you know, error information and audio settings so we can proactively work to identify issues before they become problems, which is pretty much what every application you opt into or operating system you opt into. So that part, right, the error tracking, you, you can't opt out of. Right. But here's the thing though, you know, every service I use, Spotify, Tidal, Pandora, Sonos, they already know what we listen to. Uh, and if you have home at Alexa, you know, Google or Amazon already get that voice data that Sonos is passing through to them. So. Yeah, like Sonos told ZDNet, if a customer chooses not to acknowledge the privacy statement, the customer will not be able to update the software of their Sonos system, and over time, the functionality of the product will decrease. Decrease. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like they're going to cut it off. Just sounds like just going to slowly. Sounds let it like wither. you won't get all the fancy functionality that, that you'll get after yeah. you update it. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty common whenever yeah. it comes to manufacturers, you know, s s throwing out some kind of firmware update or a software update to a, to a device. And folks wonder why I don't have smart door locks. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not freaked out about it. I'm still going to yeah. use my Sonos. I've been looking forward to integrating Alexa with it. Sorry, guys. I've been looking forward to integrating Echo with it so that yeah. I can actually use it with that integration. So I will still update it, and I know that there is a privacy thing there, but it's it's convenience over privacy in that matter. Yeah, and for Sonos, I'm not particularly worried about it. And But, you know, to Pack Northwest fans' uh, credit, this is something you should be aware of because mm -hmm. the privacy barriers or the privacy slurpiness there's a high slurpiness. slurpiness. Everybody has oh. a different line that they're willing to cross. I mean, I remember when flashlight app, like a flashlight app on Android wanted access to my contacts, my database, like everything I was browsing, my yeah. children's like DNA, you know, <laughs> they mean apps on here getting into stuff they don't belong in. That scares me a lot more than Sonos, but maybe because I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully they're being third party audited. Hopefully. All right, so moving on from that, we got to talk about an analog pick of the week. So once in a while, <sighs> put down your phone, step away from your screen, screen, <laughs> screen, close your laptop and do something analog. Like Forrest Pick, he emailed us, here is my Eclipse photo from nice. Knoxville, Tennessee. It was 99% totality. I have a wired remote for my Sony a65 camera, so I was able to take photos today, even with my arm in a sling. This one went through a little Photoshop Express lighting adjustments. And that is an awesome photo. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, Forrest. An awesome way to spend your analog day. And hopefully everybody this weekend has had some fun times uh, with Labor Day, at least in the United States. And if you did do something analog, send it to us, askatechthing.com. We would love to feature you in a future episode. Sitting in the house next to a fan sweating cats. That's pretty much what I was doing. Voice my cat. Hot. Hot here in the Bay Area. Poor cats. Oh my goodness. I'm Barry <laughs> Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. I just farted and it smelled really bad. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it just hit you. <laughs> you and Tristan are like fart buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, Thank for supporting you. this episode. We Jesus. love you all. Hang out coming soon. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's today. Isn't it? The day of the that This is episode. Wow, I can't talk. Woo! That was good. It's the heat. <laughs> I, I no, and you know, I think Pack Northwest has a really good point, though. I don't know. I'm back and forth between being super paranoid about privacy and just being like, Google knows everything. There are a lot of things thing. that I am super paranoid about, and um, phone apps are the ones that started really freaking me out. I am more paranoid about cameras and webcams and stuff like that than I am about um, audio from my speaker at home. Why does Waze want to track me 24 hours a day? <laughs> <laughs>